This podcast is brought to you by the Albany Public Library main branch and the generosity of listeners like you. What is a podcast? God, Daddy, these people talk as much as you do. (laughs) Razib Khan's unsupervised learning. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm here today with Dr. Benjamin Bassett. Uh, Ben, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm Ben, as you say. Um, At the moment, um, I'm just a researcher at Monash University in Australia, in Melbourne. And um, my sort of area of focus is uh, sort of the archaeology of the Roman period, um, particularly in Egypt, Egypt. in certain areas of Egypt. So um, that's what I've been looking at in my doctorate. And um, yeah, that's sort of what I'm doing at the moment. And so you're, you're, you're technically an Egyptologist. <laughs> um, I wouldn't call myself that simply because I, I look uh, at the Roman period. And, um, and although I've obviously done a lot of work in Egypt, um, I'm not, you know, necessarily bound to uh, bound to that. So um, I also have an interest in sort of Roman Britain, um, sort of the other side of the empire, as it were. And, um, you know, I have a particularly archaeology, particular sort of archaeology focus. I'm not really, I don't really work with the languages or, um, you know, at least not not directly mm. per se. Mostly I look at pottery and urbanism and things like that, <laughs> which of course, you know, that there's a lot of, there's a lot of written evidence Um pertaining to 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 those things as well but yeah my um my doctorate and and other work has been sort of in the the archaeology side all right well so um you know we're here not to talk about archaeology but we are here to talk about ancient history um i I guess i should start out um so a couple of years ago i think um you got on my radar because you wrote something for quillette uh progress and polytheism could an ethical west exist without christianity and um, you know it's uh, it's illustrated with a uh, I don't know if it's marble I think it's but anyway it's illustrated with um, a bust of Marcus Aurelius uh, the Stoic Roman emperor who lived flourished you know reigned between one hundred and sixty and one hundred and eighty one I believe so um, you know the whole context here is kind of an alternate history where Christianity does not become the meta ethnic transcendent metaphysical binding ideology of Western civilization. Uh, and I, I think your answer is, well, I mean, yeah, of course. And this triggered um, some controversy online. And I think you reached out just asking me, I think I had retweeted it. Maybe you'd seen it that way, but uh, you just reached out like, oh, like, you know, what do you think about these sorts of reactions? And I just, you know, I told you basically like, oh, you should just tell people to buzz off, you know, uh, they're not, they're not, they're not, they're not engaging in good faith. More recently, um, I've seen you. Uh, I don't know about outrage, but yeah, it's outrage. Like you, you, you saw a what you perceived was a Christian apologetic, which was whitewashing the history of Christianity, uh, in, in the rise of the West, and um, that was it. Was kind of like a um, it was let's say a, a very very Sam Harris like exasperated, <laughs> you know. Uh, it was like, you sure, know, yeah. 2003 Sam Harris, like, it came out there. Uh, so can you talk about um, your own perspective and why you reacted that way, what your attitude towards Christianity is and its role in Western civilization? Right, well, that's a big question. Yeah, so the, um, the well, it was a podcast the, that I sort of tweeted, um, and it was, uh, I think, from the... Um, uh, unbelievable radio uh, sort of show, which, you know, they interview a Christian and an atheist or usually, and, you know, it's a Christian station. I suppose I, I was a bit exasperated a la Sam Harris, um, 2005 or whatever, um, because um, the the conversation was just, um, you know, it's frustrating. Dan Barker was um, the atheist and the, the Christian was, uh, oh gosh, I can't remember his name, but we can look that up. Um, and they'd sort of both written books, uh, you know, on, on various aspects of God's character and um, as presented in the Old Testament. And, you know, Richard Dawkins has this famous line, you know, that God is cruel and vindictive and, I don't know, sadomasochist or whatever. 
<laughs> and they were sort of discussing this, you know, using sort of biblical, biblical uh, uh, sort of evidence, as it were, or using, you know, the biblical stories as examples. And, um, and yeah, just the, I don't know, the, the excuses that were sort of being proffered by the, um, by the Christian interlocutor, it seemed to me, sort of have this sort of moral blindness um, to the to the actual sort of atrocities that are being being depicted in the stories, and um, you know the sort of the massac- massacres of Canaanites and, and things like that, and that there's this constant need and urge to explain away, to sort of to uh, you know to produce sort of ad hoc explanations, to sort of um, appeal to some uh, sort of you know made up characteristic that that you know god is supposed to have and i suppose in that particular example i I just got a bit annoyed i don't usually tweet stuff like (laughs) like that um but um it was frustrating and um yeah i suppose it just comes off the back of uh you know recent there's been a recent sort of i don't know movement if you, you call it that um you know, there's been a few books, and I've I've, I've tweeted about sort of Tom Holland, who's an author who you know sells a lot of books. I've tweeted about him before. Um, he wrote a recent book called Dominion. You know, which sort of seeks to uh, argue that everything that's good in Western civilization essentially boils down to um, to Christianity, and everything that sort of comes before that is is a kind of um, is a kind of perverse mirror of, of you know modern Western civilization. So um, that that's actually what had sort of precip- precipitated that original article, which you've just referred to. Um, so I was really responding to that assertion that that uh, you know we would never have developed we meaning sort of you know Western European societies, I suppose, during the medieval period would never have developed sort of um, you know the kinds of morals that. Or the kind of moral uh, character that we have today, which you know, which, which values sort of individual life, you know, um, you know, affords dignity to life, um, and that's I suppose that the basis. And um, you know, in this article, I had sort of proffered, or you know, I'd suggested a kind of uh, kind of alternative historical scenario. And in history, it's always um, it's always dangerous to you know offer counterfactuals because, of course by their nature they they didn't happen <laughs> so um you know you, you can't sort of it's it's no way to sort of um y- you can't prove anything right that way so of course um there was a bit of blowback for that reason and um and yeah so so i don't know um how i, f- I feel about that article now i suppose it's um you know it is what it is obviously it's a it's kind of a plen- polemical piece it's not a it's not a, a it's not intended to be a, any kind of a, an academic sort of paper or anything, but um, you know, I just wanted to contribute something to the debate and um, you know, give my my point of view because I suppose um, you know, given sort of my interest in ancient history and obviously the Roman period, it seems to me that um, you know the, the the arrival of Christianity on some level kind of is was a fluke. You know, it wasn't sort of preordained, and um, you know, it's easy to to feel that um, kind of some some sort of nebulous, if if inevitable, historical process kind of led to this. But um, you know, I don't think it is, and uh, or I don't think you know that there are necessarily such processes. And so, the argument I had put in that article was essentially that you know, um, had Christianity not arisen um, at that time, or at least you know, had it not become more or less the state religion in, in the fourth century, by the end of the fourth century, um, we might still have seen similar kinds of ethical development in uh, in Roman society or, or post-Roman society as we eventually did. Um, you know, and, and I offered that as a kind of, um, as an idea, I suppose. You know, I'm not, of, of course, as I said, you can't, this can't be, um, can't be established with any degree of certainty or whatever, but... Um, yeah, so I guess that that was that was um, that's sort of what lies behind the article, and, and <laughs> you know my um, my thoughts about sort of Christianity and history. But yeah, I don't know if you want to explore certain aspects of it, or yeah, yeah. Um, so 
So you talked about the Old Testament. Um, I mean, that's obviously uh, kind of a separate issue. So, um, you know, there's a book called Harlot by the Side of the Road, Forbidden Tales of the Bible. It's by Jonathan Kirsch. And um, it talks about a lot of the, uh, you know, stuff in the Old Testament that might be a little bit disturbing to people. So, for example, you know, um, Moses tells tells the soldiers of the Israelites to uh, slay all the women who have known men uh, and their little ones too, and also the pregnant women, uh, but keep the uh, nubile young women, you know, so that, that uh, when I tell that, that part of the old Testament, um, multiple Christians have actually accused me of lying and have had to look it up and been shocked that it was correct. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure. But I, I was not exaggerating. Uh, um, like, that's literally, um, you know, what he was saying. So, um, you know, I don't really, you know, have much truck with uh, defending. I mean, I'm an atheist myself. Like, you know, I'm not, I don't think this is divine. But um, would you say that there's a distinction between the Old Testament God and what happened with Christianity? Like, do you make that distinction in your own head? Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, obviously, you know, Christianity arose, um, in a context in a first, in the first century, um, you know, and, and much of the development, much of Christianity, um, took place, of course, after the destruction of this, the, the second temple in Jerusalem in 70. Um, you know, if you read books like, um, uh, I don't know, Roman Jerusalem by, um, Oh, who's the guy? Martin Goodman, I think. It's a good. It's a, it's a good, good book. book. Yeah, yeah. And um, there's another recent one called The Dawn of Christianity, um, which was written by a classicist, which is another good sort of um, pricey on the period. You know, you you really come to see that um, that sort of Christianity is a well, obviously it's a multifaceted kind of historical development, but yeah, it it, it is. Um, its conception of God, I suppose, is is um, you know just as reliant on on the sort of context of that period as it is on, say, the Old Testament um, itself. Um, and you know, as author, many authors have pointed out, um, you know, the, the Jewish uh, sort of culture of that period in in Palestine and also the diaspora was, you know, quite heterogeneous and um, you know believed sort of different things about about god and you know his role in the world and um you know the the uh the qumran sect for example sort of it might have been a sect of kind of essenes you know is, is one example of a you know sect that we don't necessarily know about um you know through biblical literature but we sort of have some um you know now familiarity with um thanks to sort of you know archaeological discoveries so um so yeah, I, I do. You know, obviously, it is a development out of Judaism, a particular kind of Judaism from the first century, um, and then periods before that. And um, after seventy, it's increasingly, uh, you know, influenced by, um, uh, you know, by the if you want to if you want to say it this way, the global culture of, of its age, it, the sort of Hellenistic inheritance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, so yeah, obviously. Um, Although the the old what we what Christians call the Old Testament is obviously part of that inheritance, um, uh, you know it, it's also it's also influenced by by other by other kinds of things, and you know so is of course um, so of course is rabbinical Judaism post seventy as well. So um, you know both these religions change together um, through the first century, um, you know, and it's yeah that's quite a quite an interesting kind of um kind of story and i don't know th those books i mentioned are, are good um good good introductions to that that kind of yeah that kind of history yeah i mean i think one thing that um well actually i i do want to I, I look this up so this is the king james version uh that's the version i like i want to read the, the the part of uh now therefore kill every male among the little ones and kill every woman that hath known man by lying with him but all the women children that have not known a man by lying with him, keep alive for yourselves. So, <laughs> um, I know that that kind of by heart. And as I said, uh, when I do tell my my 
my Christian friends, uh, um, they think I'm lying to them because uh, that is such an abominable passage. And it's not the only one. It's just that, uh, um, you know, I mean, there are references in the Bible to the killing of pregnant women uh, by the Israelites at the, at the, uh, at the command of, uh, you know, God. Um, so D- Dawkins' description of the Old Testament God is, uh, it, it might be a bit memorable, but um, it's actually quite accurate. Uh, but I think we're talking about a different thing here with Christianity. And, and I guess, um, were you reacting more to the Old Testament God? Because, you know, there's this whole line of like Gnostic, Marcionite uh, Christianity, which rejects the Old Testament God as like a, you know, kind of like an evil demagogue or something. Um, but I, mean, I, I don't believe that. You don't believe that. But my point here is on some level, you know, the Lord God of the, of the Hebrew Bible is a quite different individual than the God that's depicted in, say, the Gospel of John um, and, you know, elaborated by Christian church fathers in, um, in you know, late antiquity. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I suppose, um, yeah, there, there are two sort of issues here. There's the one, you know, you've referenced the article that I um, had on on uh, Quillette um, a while ago, which was dealing with it. That wasn't really looking at the Old Testament um, God, of course. And then my recent tweet about, um, uh, you know, the, this this radio program, um, which, was, which was looking at that. So, um, you know, as I said, that was just a kind of... Um, I, I just, I just felt triggered, as it were, <laughs> by by that, um, and I suppose felt the need to express it, um, although I try not to, um, on Twitter really, and um, yeah, and the article sort of obviously, you know, had a arose out of a, a different trigger triggering event, I suppose. Um, but yeah, obviously, obviously, as I said, um, you know, th- there's a complex, yeah, there's complex sort of historical developments that that feed into the sort of new testament um depiction of of god um you know which which are often quite distinct from um from the old testament and and you get yeah you do get sort of early christian um uh i don't know movements like that of marcion um who you know who even suggests of course that they're two different uh different gods essentially um although um yeah, that, that might have been a theologically, um, I don't know, in some sense easier um, path for Christians to go down because they don't have to now, you know, invent sort of all sorts of excuses as to why, um, you know, as to why there seems to be these, uh, the differences between these characters. But mm. um, I, th- I think that's what frustrated me about that radio program because, you know, it's just, it's so obviously a kind of artifact of um, of particular historical circumstances i mean you know christianity mm-hmm. um and you know that uh yeah that, that, that it's taken seriously as a as a kind of statement about reality is, is sort of i know i just find it sort of dumbfounding um well so you know let's let's have that aside like neither yeah. of us uh like do you have any religious beliefs no no i don't no so neither of us identify, as they would say, as religious. I'm an atheist, right? Um, always have been, always will be, probably. Uh, but um, so you know, in terms of whether it's true or not, we don't. We think that these are, you know, creations of the human mind. And yet, um, you know, I mean, Tom Holland himself is still not a believer, and yet he thinks the idea of Christianity. And I haven't read Dominion. Um, I don't know if I will. I own it, but I haven't read it. Um, yet the idea the idea of Christianity transformed the West in some deep way. Um, your Quillette article in 2018, I would say that you present the hypothesis that it didn't, and that maybe Christianity was incidental. Like, I mean, what is your position right now? Yeah. Um, I haven't gone back and read the article, but I suppose I should. Um, I suppose, yeah, it's definitely not, I wouldn't say that Christianity is incidental. Obviously, it's um, uh, you know of immense importance um, on, on some level to um, to Western culture. But I suppose there were sort of two levels to what what I was saying. And um, you know, I'm not sure about you know again sort of how strongly I want to kind of stand by both these positions. But firstly, you know, there was the counterfactual idea, which is 
which is that had Christianity not arisen, um, uh, you know, there similar sort of ethical outcomes might have been possible in our um, in, in sort of Western culture broadly construed. And I argue that because, um, you know, as I say in that that article, uh, you know, I, I think much of the ethical sort of um, character of Christianity arises out of the Hellenistic context, um, particularly the Stoic context. And um, so I thought, well, the 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 sort of intellectual um, uh, firepower, if you like, was already already there. It was already in place, sort of in the first century, um, or you know, the first century BC. Um, and so, you know, had, had Christianity Christianity not sort of arisen, or or had it not at least um, become the state religion, as I said, um, there may have been a space where you know, in later centuries, um, similar kind of ethical outcomes were achieved. Um, you know, the, the eventual, um, sort of the, the, the eventual, uh, I, I don't know, sort of, um, you know, moral opprobrium cast towards the, you know, the idea or the institution of slavery. I mean, that's got its own, you know, immense history, of course. Um, and, uh, so, you know, that, that was sort of the, the first part and perhaps the, you know, perhaps the more um uh more challenging part to defend because you know as i say it's counterfactual but but uh you know anyway i I offered that as an idea at least um the second part is you know one which you know atheists especially new atheists have argued about often sort of historically inept ways though um that is that you know the extent to which christianity itself is responsible for the ethical development of the west is i think unclear um and certainly uh you know you know whether whether or not sort of the ethical zeitgeist as it were follows um follows other kinds of changes uh, or other kinds of developments like sort of technology or whatever or, or the other way around you know different different um different hist- historians have have different ideas about but you know simply kind of asserted by people like Tom Holland that you know this was this was um this was the key and I just don't think they've established that you know um in a in a historically uh convincing way um so I suppose they're the two sort of two positions I take in in that particular in that particular article well so I mean would you say so I think earlier you kind of implied that there were no inevitabilities, but I mean, do you think maybe that it was inevitable that some sort of that attitudes towards slavery were going to change no matter what? I wouldn't say it was inevitable, but um, as I say, I think there were, you know, stoicism by the, you know, the first few centuries BC already had the idea of sort of human universality, cosmopolitanism, um, the sort of... I don't want to use the word equality, but but there, there was a sort of intellectual idea, and one sees this in Cicero, you know, that all people sort of have some sort of innate um, capacity, uh, you, know, you know, sort of innate capacities. Um, so there was already, you know, even before Christianity arose, there was already a kind of philosophical, if you like, um, uh, I don't know, contradiction between sort of, uh, some, some, you know, the positions of some Stoics, especially the early Stoics, and um, and act in the way that you know society actually, you know, functioned. Um, I think it's this kind of analogous situation to um, to uh, you know meat meat eat, meat eating today. You know, there there are a lot of people who who are convinced that there's nothing ethical def- ethically defensible about eating meat, but um, you know, who either continue to eat meat themselves, or um, you know, at least live in the society that that eats meat, right? And and you know, it's possible that that in that in some hundreds of years, or perhaps even sooner than that, we will look back on consumption of meat and, and see it as a kind of fairly serious ethical um, ethical violation. And yet, most of us go through through our lives, you know, today without really worrying about it too much and I, I think you know, I think if we analogize um, sort of our 
our attitudes to that, we kind of see something about how, you know, how how ancient people might have might have seen slavery, right? It's um, it, it's something that is sort of baked deeply in, as it were. But um, but there are also, yeah, there, there's fairly there are fairly clear ethical um, problems. Um, and and as I say, the, these were. Um, these were articulated, uh, you know, by the early Stoics and, and certainly by the Roman period, um, Stoicism, um, you know, it was quite quite a popular um, quite a popular position, I suppose, in, in, in certain areas of society. And so it was certainly, you know, it wasn't like people sort of, you know, didn't have access to the sort of intellectual resources that that might have eventually. Um, uh, contributed to the the outlawing of slavery, or you know, and th- that's essentially what I'm saying in in the article. It's stoicism, you know, never it never kind of um, it's never able to transform society, but you know, it might have. I guess is what I'm saying. Um, and uh, yeah, sorry, yep, yeah. So I mean, so I guess like you know, from what I'm getting from you talking to you, and is that um. You know, it's not like you're hostile to Christianity, but it's almost it's it is that you are taking exception to the necessary role of Christianity in the development of what let's say what we call Western liberalism today. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that there's often there's often this sense that um, well, one that Christianity was kind of inevitable. I mean, people won't necessarily put it like that, but they'll sort of talk about history as though. You know that that was kind of an in an inevitable development, and also secondly, as you say, that it was somehow um, necessary, and also perhaps sometimes you know people will say you know necessary and sufficient for the development of sort of um, you know an ethical an ethical society, and um, yeah, I suppose I take exception to to that uh, to that position, and as I said, I'm sort of also ambivalent about how Christianity as a kind of, um, you know, complex of ideas, if you like, you know, interacted with, with other historical forces to produce the, um, the world we have today. You know, I mean, some, there, there'll be, you know, strong claims and, 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 and sort of, uh, you know, le- less strongly made claims, I suppose, but, um, you know, and people claim Christianity for all sorts of, all sorts of developments, pardon me. And, um, yeah, you know, often I th- I think these are sort of historically inept kinds of uh, kinds of uh, notions, but yeah. So I guess they're my two well, kind mean, of positions. So so you know, I, I'm willing to buy that it's not necessary. I, I I'll say that I, I I actually do find it quite persuasive that Christianity is an instantiation of a general trend that was happening with mystery religions and the fusion of philosophy, ethics, and uh, devotional religious cults. Basically. I think that's right. I think that's right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but uh, would you concede that it was a sufficient condition that Christianity was the vessel for the emergence of a ethical religious system? I mean, Jews would call it ethical monotheism. Um, I think it's uh, a broader category than that. But um, you know, I, Carl Jaspers would call it you know the ideas that came out of the Axial Age. You know, the, the higher religions, the philosophies, and so. Um, would you concede uh, that Christianity was the instantiation of that? And, um, or, you know, some people would say, um, some people would say that Christianity uh, destroyed the ancient liberalism, um, you know, that was existent in the Roman empire and brought a dark age. (laughs) Yeah. um, Gosh, I'm not sure I would, uh, concede that as i say i'm i'm sort of undecided on the the role that christianity later plays you know um in terms of the development of ethics in medieval and then sort of post medieval societies um sort of what what role uh the rediscovery of um hellenistic philosophies of various kinds not only stoicism but also epicureanism plays in in the development of human rights ideas and you know obviously that's not not really my field so i'm i'm sort of uncertain about that i suppose all i would say is that um you know i th- i think it's well it's sort of a 
too monocausal an explanation, but also, um, also I think you know it's not 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 established to to, to my liking um, with with any kind of with any kind of certainty or you know sufficiency that that um, that, that somehow Christianity is is the reason um, that our societies, uh, you know, for example, that that we sort of reject notions of slavery um or some something like that um so yeah as i say uh, sort of uncertain with with regards to and and you know don't i don't really have a position with regards to um the later history of christianity but but i just i just tend to think that uh these um these models that are put forward by people like tom holland are um you know they're not well supported I suppose I would say. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, so you know, Holland is a uh, a popular historian. He has his own views that he puts forward there. And you know, I have a friend who read his book, who read Dominion, and felt it was kind of like a work of apologetics, to be honest. Um, that's yeah, funny, but uh, yeah. <laughs> but he's not. He's not. Um, he's not a confessing Christian. He's not a believing Christian. That's a separate thing. I think it's a little different for Christians to analyze it objectively, just because. I mean, they think Christianity is true. And that's, yeah, yeah. It makes yeah. it difficult to imagine an alternative counterfactual. Yes, that's right. Again, I, I want to sort of be careful about distinguishing. Um, yeah, my, my my reaction to sort of that that um, that episode, which did uh, that episode of, of unbelievable, the, the program, which obviously did involve a, Christ, a Christian, you know, who was a believer, and, and obviously, you know, was motivated to want to defend those ideas as kind of. Uh, not only history, but the meta- metaphysical beliefs. Um, you know, I want to distinguish that sort of reaction that I, I might have um, from you know th- this this tendency that's become popular, pardon me, recently with people like Tom Holland, which is you know, not necessarily religious people. They're not not necessarily confessing believers, but there seems to be this urge to want to defend or um, I don't know appeal to some. Kind, something in Christianity, something in that inheritance that's valuable, and yeah, you know, I can understand that. But um, mm. yeah, I, I just tend to think that that positing that you know the, the Christianity is, is the kind of is the reason for our culture is the you know is the is, is the raison d'être. You know, as some as Jordan Peterson, he's another one who's done it a lot. You know, it's the you'll often you'll often hear the metaphor. You know, it's the we're the fish, and you know we don't notice the. Um, we don't notice the water, you know, and Christianity is the water that, you know, that we swim in. I think that just overstates it, you know, um, quite, quite a lot. I, th- I think that, as I said before, I think there's a, um, a Greco-Roman philosophical inheritance that's very important. And of, of course, some of that, um, some of that comes down to us through Christianity, um, obviously. Um, but some of it doesn't, some of it is rediscovered in, in um, you know, in, in, in what is, Mm-hmm. Well, so uh, I've listened to a little bit of what Holland says, but you know, haven't like thought about it t- too much detail. So, why, like, are you clear from him why he specifically thinks the Greco-Roman mind was so alien, the pagan mind was so alien to his Christian and post-Christian sensibilities? Well, you know, one, one can look up interviews with him, and um, you know, one, one sort of example he g- gives is Julius Caesar's invasion of Gaul, uh, which, you know, supposedly, you know, may, may have killed a million people and enslaved, you know, another million or something. And, you know, Holland sort of sort of says, well, you, you know, this is a perspective that I just can't, um, you know, I just have nothing in common with. I, you know, I, I have a sense of the... Um, I have a sense of the sanctity of life, I, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And sort of, so he draws this very definite distinction between sort of the, the pre-Christian and the, uh, you know, the post-Christian, if you like, um, worldview, that there's something sort of inherent in the pagan or the polytheistic world, which devalues human life, which just sort of looks scantily on, uh, on death, you know, doesn't, you know, let's just slaughter our way through, through history. Um, I just think, well, one, uh, Julius Caesar is not representative of most Romans. <laughs> um, you know, he was a general um, of the senatorial class. He was, um, 
uh, you know, he was a warlord, etc. Um, and certainly Roman society, especially during the, the sort of late Republic, obviously, you know, you, uh, I think you're a bit of a fan of, um, of, uh, uh, we don't say his name. We don't, we don't say his name. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, you know, obviously, um, he who shall not be named, but he who shall come. <laughs> right. Yeah. The restoration. <laughs> um, he'll be naughty or he'll get on his list. <laughs> um, yeah, well, you know, obviously, as I was saying, yeah, the late Republic is kind of, um, you know, there are certain incentives that come to be, um, that, that are instantiated in sort of the, the, the sort of upper echelons of the of elite Roman society, which, which you know, uh, which, which contribute to these the civil wars, um, including the invasion of Gaul. Um, so, you know, generals are incentivized to, to sort of, to seek, to seek um, conquest and plunder for, for the, you know, for, for their, um, for their kind of social standing and, and their, you know, political um, careers and, and what whatever. Um, you know, this is a well-known sort of well-documented feature of sort of late Republican, Republican history and sort of somewhat, you know, obviously continues into the, um, into the imperial period, the sort of uh, relationship between the emperors and the army and, 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 and all of that. Um, so, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, but but there are so many exceptions on either side of the divide that I'm not even sure how 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 this can be taken as a as a kind of um, you, you know as an interesting or valid example of sort of the the difference in sort of uh, how how the two sort of periods the post Christian the pre Christian periods worked. I mean, you know, um, w one can easily point to the conquests of Charlemagne or any Christian kings, um, you know, um, as examples of uh, sort of bloodthirsty warlords, you know, going on a rampage and killing a lot of people. So, you know, and their attitudes, are, I would submit, are not distinctly different from the attitudes that Caesar might have had. So I, I'm not really sure. The point seems to be a moral one that... Um, you know, there's some some distinct and sort of inherent difference in between the pre and, and post Christian worlds. But uh, you know, as a matter of sort of both history and also of sort of moral outlook, I'm, I can't really see it. Um, again, Caesar is is a you know m might be perhaps the most famous Roman, um, but you know, again, you know, he is he is one one character in a you know in a complex society. Um, you know, which continues developing for, you know. Caesar, Caesar was not Rome. He was not the state. <laughs> <laughs> well, not yet. Not yet. Yeah. Um, but, but do you see what I'm saying? Um, it, it seems to yeah. be an odd, odd sort of um, an odd example to you. Then anyway, well, I, yeah. mean, I mean, you can say, so I haven't read Red Holland. I haven't read Dominion. I should read it. I know I have other things to read, uh, but uh, like to be entirely frank, and so and I'm not I don't, and I, I I do not like to criticize books I have not read, so I'm not going to be criticizing the book. I would say though that um, the Gothic Wars were pretty brutal. Um, well, yeah, Italy may ha Italy may have lost half its population of these battles between the Byzantines and the Goths, who mm -hmm. were both Christian. Well, there are lots of wars that were brutal in the ancient period and in the medieval period. Um, as I say, yeah. the, the point is that I'm not I'm not quite sure as a matter of either history or of sort of ethical outlook what the takeaway is meant to be in this sort of example, um, that somehow Caesar, you know, totally disregarded human life. Well, so do most warlords, including those of the Middle Ages and the modern period. I mean, you know, it, it's... Um, it, it, it's not a particularly useful, um, yeah. It's it's not a particularly useful example, and I, I don't see, I don't see what in Caesar's war, you know, or when any war of, of antiquity, and and to you know, to argue that, yeah, you know, if you read Thucydides, to argue that Thucydides or even Homer has no regard for human life is, I think, um, uh well, you know, if you read them, you'll see that that is not the case, I would submit, um, you know, as just, just two, two sort of examples. Um, so, yeah, the, I, I suppose that, that was um, 
Well, you, one thing that I would say is that this is not about Christianity, um, partly because well, I mean, Christianity has a just war tradition. Uh, but, um, you know, Islam, for example, uh, has a codification of how you should behave in war um, to in groups and out groups. And it's very explicit. And so um, I think Muslims would argue that, well, I mean, Islam makes war more civilized and controlled and less brutal because there are rules and Christianity's just war tradition also introduced rules. Um, although the Romans themselves also had rules. I mean, they often tried to create pretexts for why they would invade. You know, they didn't just invade. So, I, you know, what I, w- what I would say is, like, it seems like there's a continuum and there's gradual change over time. Um, what I like to um, observe is that at some point in European history and modern history, uh, people stopped killing the children of their enemies like if they defeated them. So, for example, uh, Justinian II, uh, Byzantine emperor around 700 AD, you know, um, the second time he came to the throne, when he was overthrown, uh, his children were, were killed uh, after he was killed. And these are all Christians at this point. Um, or, um, you know, the two, the two princes in the tower, uh, it, you know, during, um, the war of the roses or the end of the war of the roses. In any case, um, this, this whole situation, um, it, it stopped happening at some point, um, with, with a few notable exceptions. I mean, the, the communists brought that brutality back. They killed the children of the Romanovs, but, <laughs> um, yeah, well, I mean, it depends what time frame you're talking about. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose I need to see more evidence for, for that sort of a thing. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I know Stephen Pink has kind of said that wars have become less, uh, less brutal after the Second Second World War. Um, but you know, again, I, I don't. That that process has nothing to do with Christianity. That that's 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 a process that's got you know something to do with with the modern world. Um, I would, I would mm-hmm. submit mm-hmm. Um, the post post war modern world at that, that um, you know something that that's a completely different historical process. So we're talking about historical processes and inevitability. Mm-hmm. Is there anything about the rise of Christianity that you think changed the trajectory of Western civilization or changed some aspect of Western civilization? Oh well, yes, yeah. No, I shouldn't. Um, I should make it clear that I'm not. You know, no point would I think that. You know, of course, had 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 Roman con- had the Romans continued to have um, continued to have been poly polytheists, even henotheists. Um, yeah, you know, obviously, the culture, the society that we that we live in now, if if that even is a meaningful statement, probably kind of isn't really. But you know what what I mean. Um, you know, it would of course be very different. You know, um, but uh, you, you know what what Christianity, of course, um, introduced was was um, you know what Jan Asman has called the sort of mosaic distinction, and and that is that. Um, you know that th- th- there was a sort of ideological, I don't know, theological um, commandment now to to worship the one God, um, to direct one's energy in that in that sort of way, and then to um, to disavow um, other gods, essentially as as either evil or demonic or something like that. And that is a you know that that introduces a very um, a distinct kind of. Uh, I don't know, a sort of alignment um, into into Roman culture when it when it when it's adopted and then eventually made the state religion and and um, yeah that, that's that's a very different kind of social um, or you know that that produces very different kinds of social cultural cultural outcomes. So I don't want to don't want to sort of deny that. And mm-hmm. and again, you know, um, that may have involved sort of ethical outcomes as well. It, Again, I don't. I don't want to sort of. Um, I don't want to necessarily deny that. I'm just, um, you know, as I said before, I'm just not not convinced that um, that Christianity is is sort of, as it were, solely responsible. Well, on the one hand, solely responsible for um, for the kind of societies that we live in today and the ethical outlooks or the you know the ethical attitudes. Um, nor am I convinced that. You know, in the in the, the counterfactual where polytheism um, remained a kind of de facto spiritual alignment, um, 
you know, that slavery, for example, would not eventually have been abolished in light of the, you know, in light of the contradiction that, that um, you know, that was already apparent, as I said, you know, um, in the, in the philosophy, in, in Hellenistic philosophy between mm. the sort of cosmopolitanism, the Stoics and the, you know, the, um, the practices of slavery. Um, so, um, you know, even, even, as I say, so even, even before Christianity arose, there's already, um, you know, in the, in the Greek world itself, that there, there, there is already a kind of, um, disposition towards humanity, which, which is much more sort of, uh, uh, I don't know, inclusive, if you if you want to use that that word, um, than for example, you know the the oft cited um, attitude of Aristotle, who you know thought that they were sort of natural slaves and, and whatever. And you know the attitude of Aristotle is not the attitude of all of antiquity, as, as many people take it to be. Um, you know, so yeah, um, I don't know if that answers your question, but <laughs> no, no, it does. It does. I mean, I think. I mean, you know, despite your, um, you know, vociferous response that I saw that prompted me to reach out and talk to you, you turn out to be a, a pretty much a moderate on these questions. I mean, obviously not a uh, Christian chauvinist of any you know form, but n- neither are you a uh, new atheist. Religion is the root of all evil. Well, yeah, the the notion that really, I mean, obviously that's an absurd statement if you take it at face value. And that's always something that sort of annoyed me about some of that dogma or well, some of that, some of that, um, I don't know what you call it. Um, you know, hyperbole really. Yeah. Um, yeah it's an, it, it, um, the, the new atheist canon is, is spare and thin, but it is <laughs> somewhat dogmatic. Um, you know, but having there, said, there is, there is yeah. no God and Richard Dawkins is not his prophet. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, yeah, look, I don't know. I like Richard, I must say. Um, I met him once, actually, when he was here in Australia. Um, but um, at the, uh, what was it, the Global Atheist Convention in 2012, I think that that was like a, that was like the last year of that whole thing. After that, it, it just seemed to uh, sort of seemed to die away, calm down. But, um, or at least after, yeah, after Hitchens died, it seemed to lose a lot of, a lot of energy. But, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, no, no. I, I mean, there are certain statements, of course, like you know, religion is the root of all evil, or this, this sense that without religion, you know, good people are good, and you know, um, bad people are bad, and with, um, you know, it takes religion to to make good people do bad things. I mean, if you broaden that statement to mean sort of ideology, maybe it makes more sense. But even there, I wouldn't agree with it. But, um, but uh, yeah, so. I don't know. I, I would definitely call myself an atheist. I, I don't know if I'd call myself a, a new atheist, though, in that in that way. <laughs> so, so we're coming full circle then. Um, mm. You know, I start out kind of introducing you as a angry young man, you know, <laughs> the, the Lord God on high, and now you're, um, you know, you're putting a good word, putting <laughs> a good word for Christ and uh, his fellow travelers. Well, I, w- I, wouldn't, the... I wouldn't say that, but <laughs> I mean, I'm still, you know, I'm frustrated by, I don't know what frustrates me is when you look at the Roman world, um, you know, one is constantly faced with the reality, the sort of burden of the next 2000 years of history, which turned out the way they did. And so it's hard to sort of go back and um, sort of strip all that away and then sort of not only the history itself, but also the sense, as I, as I said before, the, the sense that somehow it was inevitable that, you know, Roman history before Christianity was kind of a, um, a prelude to the important stuff that comes after, um, which, you know, obviously I don't think that's what it is. I think it's, you know, it has its own kind of um, validity and, uh you know, so you're always having to um, having to sort of do that, and you know, Christians themselves will, do often become involved in in debates about ancient history, and that's fine. Of course, I don't want to stop anyone doing that. It's just, um, you know, sometimes I wish there would be more sort of acknowledgement of the bias, which is introduced by the fact that you know. Um, there are certain metaphysical beliefs which in one way or another hinge on this history, right? I mean, um, 
and hinge on you know events in in the first century and and um yeah for me i just i don't know how you can talk about history the history of the period um i don't know i want to be careful what i say here i don't of course i, I think christians can talk about you know the history of, of the ancient world but um yeah i don't, I don't know I, I just think it'd be nice it'd be nice if, if christians acknowledge their bias somewhat more you know readily sometimes mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. yeah there it's not it's not the view from nowhere no no it's, and it's definitely a view from somewhere and obviously there's no you know there's no view from nowhere in history but um but you know, I would submit that having a secular worldview is not simply the equivalent in the other direction of being a Christian. Um, you know, because I'm open to I'm open to the historicity of um, of certain events that Christians claim happened. You know, having actually happened, of course. It's just that um, there's all sorts of metaphysical baggage, as I would see it. That you know, I'm not going to sort of lay over that as well. Um, and I think that is baggage in the sense that it's it's extra. You know, it's extra kind of assertions. It's it, it, it's it's extra stuff that you've um, the you know, as far as I'm concerned, you you need to provide evidence for. And um, mm-hmm. I think it, you know, it can. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think the point the point I've made, you know, wanted to make is is, is there. So <laughs> I won't say any more about that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um... So yeah, I think I think we've we've touched on most of the the questions that I had for you, and I think, I you know I I don't think our positions are necessarily that far apart. I think uh, you know I just caught you in a particular moment, and uh, you know, you know it's like it's like if you read David Hume, there's that whole issue about like identity and are you really the same person across the sequence, and um, you know what was salient to me was um, your kind of a uh, triggered reaction to a christian apology uh, you know christian apologist but the reality is like your own position is quite quite mild and moderate <laughs> well yeah i just want to yeah i suppose clarify that um yeah i mean in that particular example as i said from that that radio program um i suppose what i was as it were triggered by um was sort of less less of kind of historical um claims than just the this, this sense that the clear moral, the clearly moral position is, is, you know, is being sort of, um, is being argued away um, in an attempt to sort of save face. And I don't know if that strikes me as um, kind of morally dishonest, mm-hmm. uh, you know, just, just own the fact that it's, you know, that it's uh, not presenting a, you know, a nice picture of these events. Um and move yeah. on, you know, don't, um, and, you know, obviously Christians do have all sorts of ways of, um, you know, of, of dealing with, with the, the sort of moral duplicities in the Old Testament, but, um, you know, I'm not convinced by any of them, um, but uh, yeah, that wasn't a particularly sophisticated one. I don't know, that just, it just frustrated me <laughs> in, that, in the moment, yeah. Well, I mean, that's fair enough, but um, I think uh, you know, positive side, it, it opened up a, uh, you know, path for this conversation, which I wanted to have for a while. So um, you know, I I, I want to um thank you for coming on and discussing this issue, and you know, um, I think we we touched, yeah, we, we talked about a lot of different things, but um, you know, the whole point here is not to convince, you know, I don't think to convince each other. I just want to know about like what other people are thinking because um. I feel like we live in a time of religious change right now. So some of the lessons from antiquity might be a little bit more relative relevant than we would have thought a few years ago. Mm. And just want to say briefly, um, there is, I mean, Tom Holland, you know, is only one writer who's, who's dealing with some of these issues. Obviously I mentioned Jordan Peterson. He has a similar view, but also um, people like Ross Douth at, of the New York times. He's, um, you know, he's written a bit about the so-called return of paganism um, you know, in his, um, I've heard him talk about that in various, various places. <laughs> so I have, I have a history, I have a history with Ross. We're friends. Um, oh, okay. he right. linked to a blog post. He linked to a blog post I wrote in 2005 from the blog that he was writing at. And, um, that blog post title was a prayer for emperor. And it was about the return of paganism. Oh, there you go. Yeah. You were ahead, so. of, ahead, of, ahead of, ahead of the curve there. Um, 
but yeah, obviously he's a Catholic and um, I suppose on some level sees the return of paganism if indeed, you know, that is a meaningful um, statement about, about our condition. Um, I guess on some level as a kind of um, a fallback into, you know, into the darkness of, of mm-hmm. you know, the pre-Christian era, but obviously I don't. You know, it, it, it's the Jahiliya. <laughs> as Muslims would say, right? right. Yeah, I yeah. mean, you know, it's not it's not necessarily obviously the return of the ancient cults, but it is the return of a sensibility of an individual atomistic sense of uh, religious community that's fractured through different viewpoints yeah. and metaphysics, yeah. right? Yeah, that's right, and um, yeah, I think I think there's something to that broad vision of um, of you know what we might call paganism yeah but anyway that i guess that's a conversation for another day but but yeah it is in the air it is in the air that that this discussion so it's interesting and i'm you know i'm interested in what uh, ross and other people say about it so mm-hmm. mm. well, maybe i should make sure reach out to him but um well mm. um well you know gods be with you <laughs> <laughs> and also with you yeah <laughs> all, right, all right no worries thanks This podcast for kids.